Good evening. My name is Markella Patitsis, and I'm the assistant director at the Maliotis Cultural Center. And on behalf of Presbytera Chrysula Kurkundi, the executive director, and our whole team here at Maliotis Cultural Center, we'd like to welcome you to Greek Women from Antiquity to Now, a mini conference brought to you by the Maliotis Cultural Center of Hellenic College and Holy Cross. The Maliotis Cultural Center's mission is to promote Hellenic culture and language. We pursue our mission through diverse programming, including lectures, seminars, and conferences, Greek concerts and dance performances, student engagement, traveling, and permanent exhibits, and Hellenic American community events, and through the support of patrons and viewers like you. If you enjoy this event, please consider supporting the center and attending our other upcoming events including the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America's 100-year conference happening next week from Thursday to Friday, October 6th to 7th, a night of poetry with Dimitrios Thimosthenes Despotidis on October 20th, and an event that's happening in cooperation with the Unarios Library on October 25th. You can learn more about these and other offerings on our website, maliotis.hchc.edu, our Instagram, Facebook, or by signing up for our newsletter. Tonight's mini-conference, Greek Women from Antiquity to Now, is brought to you by the Maliotis Cultural Center and is a one-day conference featuring four speakers who will present on Hellenic women, myth mythological figures, historical figures, and their influence. We will hear from Dr. Samatia Dova on female agents of Nostos in the Odyssey, Dr. Kiki Karoglu will present on dangerous beauty, gorgons, sirens, and sphinxes in classical art. Eleftheria Gufa will offer remarks on female nature, and we will close with the continuation of our Meet the Artist series with the presentation by Hellenic Heads exhibition artist, George Petridis. To start us off, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. George Cantonis, the president of Hellenic College Holy Cross. Thank you, Markella. Um, on behalf of Hellenic College and Holy Cross, I welcome all both in person and live streaming to this exciting event. It is not often that one can attend an exhibit of outstanding art and be able to hear the reflections and the thoughts of highly educated commentators, but also be able to listen and to meet the artist himself. We're honored to be able to present and exhibit your work, Mr. Petridis, and even more so, really, that you've joined us this evening. Our Professor Matadova, Dr. Kiki Koroglu, formerly of the Met in New York, and, uh, and Letheria Gufa, amongst other responsibilities, a conservator of the Benaki and cultural manager. We look forward to hearing from you all. We thank you all specifically for making this such a special event, but I must take the opportunity to specifically thank Executive Director of the Maliotis Cultural Center, Presbytera Chrysula Kukundi, for all of her efforts in arranging this exhibit, not only working with the artist, but actually driving to the Hamptons with Markella to personally load the sculptures in a van and transport them to us here in Brookline. That's the kind of dedication that we have amongst our team here at the Maliotis Center. Thank you all again for attending. Please enjoy what I believe will be a truly enriching evening. I'm so pleased to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Stamatia Dova. Stamatia Dova is a professor of classics and Greek studies at Hellenic College in Brookline, Massachusetts. She teaches and publishes on archaic and classical Greek poetry, ancient Greek athletics, and the concept of the hero in ancient Greece. She's the author of The Poetics of Failure in Ancient Greece, and Greek Heroes in and Out of Hades, and the editor of Historical Poetics in 19th and 20th Century Greece, Essays in Honor of Li Lili Makrakis. Samatia Dova is also the director of the Kalinikion Institute of Hellenic College Holy Cross, and an associate in athletics, Hellenism, and poetics at the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. Her current book project 
entitled The Poetics of Olympism, examines the cultural poetics of ancient Greek sport and its reception by the modern Olympic movement. Tonight, Dr. Dova's talk is entitled Female Agents of Nostos in the Odyssey. Welcome, Dr. Dova. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Can you hear me? <laughs> thank you, Markella, for this wonderful welcome, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation, Presbyteria Kurkunti, and uh, congratulations on the wonderful work you do here at the Maliotis Cultural Center. Um, it is a pleasure to be here tonight, and I apologize ahead of time because I will have to compress a wonderful poetic tradition, the tradition of the Odyssey, into a 20-minute presentation. So I shall endeavor to... Uh, simply provide commentary to a set of beautiful images, ancient and modern. And to that effect, I have a very powerful PowerPoint. Excellent. And uh, I am in the picture, spoiling the picture. I apologize for that as well. But <laughs> be as it may, my topic today explores the role of female characters as a decisive factor in Odysseus's homecoming, his nostos. And here first we have to decide how long we're going to spend on each important concept and uh, this is the most important so we might as well spend a whole minute on it. Nostos is the prize the hero of the Odyssey is after. It is the concept of homecoming, the goal of making it back to the ancestral hearth after long and arduous adventures. Nostos for Odysseus is this beautiful image. I tried to hide some yachts behind <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, little box with a scroll. Of course, the island of Ithaca. And uh, for him, Nostos is the return to Ithaca. He is an epic hero. He has in his record a lot of glory from the fall of Troy. He is the man who designed the Trojan horse. He is credited with this incredibly clever device with the canning intelligence that brings forth the fall of, of a great city, even though 10 years of war didn't manage to. Still, the Odyssey has been interpreted as an epic of return and homecoming, as a journey of self-discovery and a window into the human life and soul. It has been viewed from many perspectives, focusing on Odysseus as the champion of mortality and the embodiment of resilience and cunning. He is the ultimate mortal hero. He doesn't mind dying. He wants to make the most of his life. He seeks personal fulfillment with an astonishing stability. And here I will... My approach to the totality of the Odyssey's charm and appeal will be to follow the hero's trip through its emotional stops and see which parts of the hero's journey present opportunities for personal growth. How can we define, however, an emotional stop, quote unquote, in the Odyssey? Odysseus seems to benefit in some way from all of his experiences and through his accumulated wisdom to reach a point of maturity that makes him appreciate even his own impending death. Here we will look briefly at several female characters in the Odyssey who not only help Odysseus grow as a person, but also reach his goal of Nostos. And uh, this is some research that I published 10 years ago and to which I return every year when I teach my favorite course, The World of Greek Heroes, which is part of our core program here at Hellenic College. And I'm delighted to see among the audience some of my former and current students. So they know who they are. We have a secret bond. This is our nostos. And of course, these characters, these female characters, are significant stops in Odysseus's journey of nostos. This nostos is a journey of self-discovery and personal fulfillment. And 
Traditionally, we have been focusing on Odysseus as the Nostos hero, as the hero of homecoming, as the star of the Odyssey, and of course, he is that. But now we have to look at the role these female characters play, these women in his journey, and how they enable his Nostos. Because why without them, there is no Odyssey. There is no Nostos. And here, let us look at Duvet's paintings. And uh, the one on the viewer's left, I have chosen as the template for my heroes, the World of Greek Heroes course. And of course, it is a famous, famous vase painting where we see It will go back. We see on the left Penelope and Telemachus. Telemachus is Odysseus and Penelope's son. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the story. And what is in the background is a loom. So here I will just mention the metaphor of text as textile, the weaving of the threads that make the heroic narrative. And two threads that make the heroic narrative in the Odyssey are the homecoming veteran, the theme of the war hero who returns home, and of course he's in a hurry to get home as quickly as possible, and the thread of the traveler, the adventurer. And this kind of hero wants to take as much time as possible to accumulate experience, to enrich his knowledge of the world and of people. And occasionally these two strands come into conflict. However, the poem more or less manages to interweave them successfully. And here we have another reference to the loom. In this case, it is not Odysseus's long story. It is Penelope's cunning intelligence, her use of her weaving project, which is a shroud for her father-in-law Laertes, Odysseus's father. And here she is discharging of her duties as queen and daughter-in-law before she will be forced, she thinks, she fears, to marry one of her suitors. Now, the pressure is getting bigger, heavier, and more painful for the very simple reason that 20 years have gone by and Odysseus has not accomplished Nostos. And she comes up with this very clever, cunning plan of getting extensions, not giving an answer over whom and when he will marry, she will marry, but keep saying that she hasn't finished her weaving, which she needs to prepare before she makes a decision. And of course, she works during the day, she unravels during the night, and this is part of her strong desire to remain in, in Odysseus's household. Her deceit is exposed, she's forced to finish, and then happens our odyssey. This is the moment of truth. This is the crucial moment when this woman who is under pressure to marry someone who is not her husband, so her, while her husband is either lost at sea or somewhere in the world of myth and exotic travels or simply in the dire realities of his homecoming trip as a veteran. In a nutshell, we have a female figure, and you see how dejected and destitute she is, and her son, too, who is a young adult, and he's trying to complete his journey to adulthood. He's not there yet. The transition is very painful. He's an adolescent still. He doesn't have authority over his household. He is a boy who grew up without a father. And in this situation, they both trying to find a way to hold on to what they have until Odysseus comes back. And as part of this endeavor, on your right, you see one of Telemachus' first steps during the outing he makes into the world. He secretly leaves Ithaca and tries to go to Pylos and Sparta to get information about his father. And he's looking for his father and at the same time for himself. Because in Greek myth, when the hero finds the father, he finds himself. 
Now here you have a contemporary rendering of Penelope and uh, the painter who, um, whose work I accessed uh, a few days ago and I have been using this image to illustrate Penelope's quality as steadfast, as someone who is firm on the ground and can be counted upon to perform and maintain stability. She is what Homer calls embeda. Embeda means firm on one's feet, steadfast. And her steadfastness is the rock upon which Odysseus counts for resuming his, stouts, his status in Ithaca after 20 years of absence. We must remember that Penelope is an agent of Nostos more than simply a passive entity awaiting Odysseus's return. Without Penelope, there is no Nostos. She is the one who keeps Odysseus in his place, in that empty and painfully, painfully trespassed upon household by the suitors who consume Odysseus' goods and squander his property and the political crisis in Ithaca, for about which there is nothing Telemachus and Penelope can do. So in this respect, Penelope is the agent of Nostos and she is Odysseus' equal. Now we have I have a few other characters. And the second one is Circe. Um, I would like to introduce her as um, an exotic element, a very popular element in the visual record in ancient iconography. Here we have one of the earlier, uh, she is one of the earlier stops in Odysseus's journey. And uh, in her island, Odysseus and his companions spend an entire year. Circe is an attractive, independent, and strong-minded sorceress who encompasses a wide range of skills and abilities. Her strong, her trademark, her strongest trademark, is her unique recipe to turn men into pigs, a predicament cleverly avoided by Odysseus thanks to his association with Hermes, the trickster god, who provides him with the antidote to the magic potion. Now, the allure Circe has as a theme is evident. We have several representations. Here's one actually from right around the block here at the MFA. And uh, you have um, a combination of human and uh, animal characteristics in uh, the companions who are transformed into pigs temporarily. Because uh, thanks to Hermes's instruction of Odysseus, the two partners, Circe and Odysseus, come to an understanding and they're able to reconcile their divergent interests and unite in a year-long relationship. And this is a pause. This is a temporary reset that the Nostos hero needs. Now, this theme evokes the motif of the princess and the wanderer. And we will see this applied in the Odyssey again in the characters of Nausicaa and Calypso. So they are female characters who are alluring, intelligent, independent, and strong-willed, who find, whom Odysseus finds along the way and receives from them encouragement, wisdom, instruction, and most importantly, a purpose a sense of focus and, and ambition. And this is, of course, always invested towards his nostos. Now, um, Circe is not as gentle and uh, is not as accommodating as her counterparts, Calypso and Nausicaa, because her role is really to facilitate Odysseus's nostos, but not help him bring it to completion. She is one of the earlier stages. And um, their encounter is brief and fairly predictable, given the fact that it occurs early on in Odysseus's homecoming journey, while his companions are still alive and somehow they have to be included in the plot. 
And so after a year of staying at Circe's island and feasting and resting, this sense of inertia becomes negative and soul devouring and they have to go. But in order to go, they first have to consult Circe who gives them the most dreadful news. In order to set out on his journey, Odysseus has to attempt the most dreaded of labors, a descent to the underworld. And thanks to Circe's instruction, they do go to the underworld and thus they become twice dying. They are endowed with the knowledge of afterlife. Not so much his companions who eventually will perish after they slaughter the cattle of the sun, but especially Odysseus and especially through some special encounters he has. Now, this is an encounter that um, is with the anti-hero of the Odyssey, and one of the main reasons I include this is that the god Hermes is on Odysseus's right, which means his transition to the underworld is guaranteed and will be successful. The character on Odysseus's left is the anti-hero. Um, I don't have time to elaborate on that, but this is the only depiction in the world of this episode, and we have it right here in Boston. Now, among the other encounters Odysseus has in the underworld is an encounter with his mother. I will skip the encounter with the seer Tiresias, who gives him precious advice on what to do when he returns back to Earth. But here we have, we have a reconstruction of a lost to us baby. And Emmanuel, can you go two slides back? I don't want to waste time, excellent. Here you have a reconstruction of a lost to us painting based on a description by the traveler Pausanias in the second century AD. And regrettably, we don't have the painting itself. It was in the meeting ha place house of the Cnidians at Delphi. And here I have in the circle, the two characters of Odysseus goes to the underworld. The character he goes to the underworld to meet first the seer Tiresias who is first and then you have the seated figure. I have a detail at the bottom right. And this is his mother, Anticlea. This is a highly emotional encounter for the very simple reason that he had no idea that she had died. He had not had any news of her, let alone he had not seen her for about 13 years. And it comes to him as a shock to see her shade in Hades. At the same time, this is a rebirth for him. The encounter they have, the conversation they hold, and especially the closure. He tries to embrace her shade. Three times he tries, and three times he fails. He gets very, very sad. He wonders if Persephone, the queen of Hades, has sent him this shade to tease him, to increase his pain. But his mother reassures him that this is not the case. And she explains to him what happens after death, how the life force, how the soul departs from the body and enters the realm of the dead, how the physicality, the materiality ends and the spirituality, the non-materiality begins. And because of that, he cannot embrace her. Now, he reaps a significant esoteric gain by just learning. He's not an initiate, but still, he acquires precious insight into the afterlife. And most importantly, what makes a huge difference in his nostos is the parting words his mother has for him. But seek the sunlight now quickly. She asks him to go back on earth and live his life to the fullest. To leave behind him the grim Hades, the realm of the dead, and to focus again on his nostos. And so he does. Another benevolent female character to Odysseus 
is a sea divinity. We don't have an ancient depiction of her with a deceased body. Here we have a modern one. Her name is Aino. She is a sea divinity. She has suffered herself a very traumatic immortalization. She is the victim of a catapontismos, a jumping from a high point into the sea, and she has her own tragedy. But she became a sea divinity. She helps mariners, and she helps Odysseus. When he is about to drown, when he has given up any hope of survival, she appears from the depths of the ocean and gives him a magic veil. And that magic veil will see him through to the shore and he will drop it back in the ocean and he will be rescued. And of course, there is Calypso, she who conceals. The nymph, the divinity, who will provide Odysseus with shelter for seven years. And she is a gentle yet independent presence, she will fall in love with him and she will make him the greatest offer, the most astounding offer a mortal can receive to make him ageless and immortal. And yet he refuses, he politely declines, he appreciates her generosity, but he is a mortal hero and he wants to return to his mortal bride. So the Nosto stage of actual return is reactivated. And Odysseus is patron goddess, Athena, who is another female, strong female figure throughout the Odyssey, makes sure that when he is shipwrecked, about to die, he will meet a princess at the shore who will give him clothes, and information about how to get to the palace and supplicate the queen and king and get safe passage to Ithaca. Her name is Nausicaa. She's at the very, very end of the image. And of course, at the center stands Athena, imposing and imperious, in full command of the plot and in full command of Odysseus's destiny. Now, when Odysseus gets home, there's another benevolent female presence who will recognize him. First, I'm sure you have heard the story, his nurse, Euryclea. And this is another rebirth because the symbolism of the washing as she washes her his feet, because this is the custom of Homeric hospitality, she recognizes him. He's incognito. Nobody knows he's Odysseus. He has come as a beggar. And yet, she's the only one who can tell this is Odysseus because of a scar on his leg. And this is not just any scar. This is a scar he sustained during an injury, boar hunting, in not any boar hunt, in one of the hunts that constituted his rite of passage into adulthood. So as a young, young boy, Odysseus received this car, and this is the token of recognition that Euryclea uses to first welcome him home in utter secrecy. And finally, we have another encounter, but not early recognition, when Penelope, in her strong, steadfast fidelity, shares with the stranger, in a strange intuition, her pain and sorrow for her missing husband. This missing husband eventually will reveal himself. He's there right in front of her. And the news will reach Penelope. Here you have seated in a very sad, melancholic pose, Penelope, the wife waiting for her husband, while standing behind her is Euryclea, trying to convince her that Odysseus has come home. Yet, remember, Penelope is not a passive entity. She is responsible for Odysseus's nostos, and she will decide when this nostos has reached its fullness. And the nostos has reached its fullness, of course, after the, the suitors have been punished for their trespasses and for their hubristic behavior in Odysseus's palace. 
And that comes when finally Odysseus has revealed himself and Penelope refuses to accept him. She refuses to yield to the external pressure that this is her husband who came home after 20 years. And so in her cunning intelligence, she puts him to the test. And the test is, she tells Euryclea to set up the bed, her marital bed, outside of the bedroom for the guest, for this man who purports to be her homecoming husband. And it is at that moment that Odysseus will explode with rage because he built that bed on an entire trunk of a tree, an olive tree that cannot be moved, not, that not even the strongest, the strongest man cannot take out of the room. And this is the moment when Penelope's intelligence completes Odysseus's nostos, because this is the moment when Penelope will be persuaded that this is her husband. And of course, the symbolism is evident. The symbolism of the steadfast bed and the symbolism of the steadfast agent of nostos, when the two spouses eventually meet at that moment, at that point, at that steadfast marital bed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Doba, for taking us on that journey with you. Our next speaker is Dr. Kiki Karoglu. Dr. Kiki Karoglu specializes in classical art, ancient Greek myth, the reception of classical antiquity, and the history of collections. Formerly an associate curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, she curated the acclaimed exhibitions Pergamon and the Hellenis Hellenistic Kingdoms in the Ancient World in 2016, and Dangerous Beauty, Medusa in Classical Art, from February 2018 to February 2019. Dr. Karoglu is a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Previously, she taught at Hellenic College Holy Cross in Boston, the University of Toronto, the College of New Jersey, and Princeton University, and held fellowships and internships at the Getty Research Institute, the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, the Princeton Art Museum, and the Acropolis Museum. She has participated in numerous archaeological excavations in the Mediterranean and has published and lectured extensively. Kiki received a PhD in classical art and archaeology from Princeton University. Tonight, Dr. Karoglu will pre present on Dangerous Beauty, Gorgons, Sirens, and Sphinxes in Classical Art. Welcome, Dr. Karoglu. better. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Markella. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Vitera uh, Chrysoula, for in, uh, your kind <laughs> invitation. I'm so glad to be back here. I was here last spring. I see some of my students in the class. We went to the museums together here in Boston. And t although today I'm going to talk to you about another m exhibition at uh, another museum, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, the Masters of Ancient Greek Myths, the, the Gorgon Medusa, Sirens, the Sphinx, Scylla, were imagined as hybrid, blending the human female form with elements of, from animals such as snake. Maybe you can help. Snakes, birds, dogs, and fish. This fantastic creature symbolized all that was alien and strange. From the fifth century on, they were tra uh, transformed gradually from grotesque to beautiful. Beauty was understood as harmony and ideal proportions, 
there was a hallmark of the classical Greek style in art that influenced uh, the representation of not only of the human body, but also of these mythological beings. Yet even when they were beautiful, they retained their terrifying power. Medusa's gaze, the siren song, and the Sphinx's riddle uh, remained extremely dangerous. At the same time, in a society that exalted the male citizen, the feminization of monsters served to demonize women. This connection of beauty and horror, embodied above all in the figure of Medusa, outlived antiquity, fascinating and inspiring artists through the centuries. Medusa became the archetypical femme fatale, the, a, a conflation of femininity, erotic desire, violence, and death. S in a way, she foreshadows the concept of the seductive yet threatening female that emerges in the late 19th century in reaction to the expanding role of women in public life and their demands for equality. So these are some of the main ideas that inform the exhibition that I uh, curated at the MEC BET, as was already mentioned, Dangerous Beauty, Medusa, and Classical Art, uh, on which my talk is based today. The exhibition uh, features a wide range of artworks, primarily drawn from the collection of the MEC, and dating from the late 6th century BC to the 20th century, including ancient Greek armor, drinking cups, funerary urns, neoclassical cameos, symbolist prints, and modern fashion by Versace. It, it proved successful, welcomed over 200,000 visitors, and was given a two-month extension. The Gorgons The Gorgons, who were the, who are the Gorgons? Were these frightful monsters that lived in the Western Ocean, which was considered the end of the Ecumeni, the end of the inhabited world. So they were uh, creatures living at the, the end of the world. They had large heads with glaring eyes, lolling tongues, snake and wind hair, uh, tusks, brazen hands, and golden wings. Whoever looked upon their hideous faces would turn instantly to stone. You know the myth. Medusa, of course, is the most famous because of her role in the legend of Perseus. Just briefly about the myth, King uh, Polydectes of Seriphos tricked Perseus into promising as a wedding gift the head of Medusa, the one of the three sisters, who was the only mortal one. The other, one, the other two were immortal. With the help of the gods, the hero flew to the ocean and found the Gorgons asleep. Using a bronze shield as a mirror to avoid the, the, her petrifying gaze, he beheaded Medusa. What we see on the screen is a vase that shows the action following Medusa's decapitation. We see the winged Pegasus springing from the severed neck while her body lies on the ground gushing blood. Meanwhile, Perseus escapes with Medusa's head in his special bag, you see it here, called the Kivisi. Now, Perseus used Medusa's severed head as a weapon many times prior to giving it to Athena as a gift for her help in the legend, in his quest. Uh, the goddess placed Medusa at the center of her aegis, uh, that is the protective breastplate made of goat skin and fringe with snakes, and I saw you here, sorry. No. Can we, is this, can we go back, why? <coughs> Just briefly here, no, 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 that's fine. So you see here, this is the edges. Usually Medusa, the, he the head occupies the center. You see in the many representations, in, in Greek art and later in Roman, in Roman art. Uh, now, in Athenic art, uh, Medusa is always dep is depicted both as a full figure and a severed head or mask that is called a gorgonion. The archaic gorgon is always full face, 
frontal, glaring directly at the viewer, as the examples you see here. Now, in the classical art, Medusa was transformed into an attractive young woman. This red figure, Peliki at the Met, which is one of the main pieces of the show, kind of the inspiration for the show, preserves one of the earliest representations of the beautiful Medusa in Greek art. Uh, as you see, the Gorgon sleeps peacefully on a hillside as Perseus approaches with a sickle in his hand and cuts, is about to cut, grabs here by the hair, is about to decapitate her. He looks away to avoid her deadly gaze while uh, the goddess Athena just looks on, stands by. Uh, the act of beheading a sleeping maiden seems rather unheroic, however. So it's not clear uh, whether the scene on the vase was intended to elicit sympathy for the monster or laughter at the hero. In the late classical period, the trend towards humanization and feminization intensified, while at the same time, the violence of the archaic representations of the beheading returned. And this is a characteristic example, uh, this fourth century Peliki in the Hermitage, who shows Medusa now w wingless and nude from the waist up, uh, with an agonized expression on her face, gesturing for dramatically for uh, pleading for her life. Both an aggressor and a victim, she becomes a tragic figure. According to a later tradition told by the Roman poet Ovid in his Metamorphosis, Medusa was originally a beautiful maiden with much admired hair. After Poseidon seduced her inside the temple of Athena, the goddess punished Medusa by tearing her into this, tearing her hair into serpents and transforming her into a horrible looking gorgon. This transition from a tale of a hero combating a monster to the sad story of a beautiful maiden transformed into a monster affected the artistic representations of the myth over time. <coughs> Centuries later, Medusa's decapitation remained a popular subject in art and I'm showing you here Caracci's fresco in the Palazzo Farnese in Rome, for example. Or this 18th century etching by Ranciman was included in the show that attempts to provoke pity in the viewer for the monster's impending demise. You can see, oh, sorry. See Medusa here and the sister sleeping. And and Perseus approaching and Athena behind him holding his, holding uh, her shield as a mirror. Now, the Gorgonion, so the mask, the severed head, also went this underwent a similar transformation that can be observed in a variety of objects. And you see, you don't, I don't even have to tell you, you can see it very clearly here on these antel pictures, starting from here, from left to right, you see this is the earliest example the early 6th century down to the 4th and 3rd century BC. And the fixes for those that don't know were these decorative tiles that lined the roofs of Greek, ancient Greek temples and other buildings. You can see it's uh, these uh, bronze greaves here and here in the uppermost part that protects the, the kneecap of the warrior. And of course, Medusa was a, a typical and very apt uh, fitting embellishment in general for arms and armor because it was thought that her transfixing countenance would provoke, has defensive powers and would provoke fear, uh, invoke fear in the opponent. You see it again, an early example in the show, Achilles and his shield is this occupied by this terrifying uh, Gorgonion, and later on the, more the beautiful type 
on the Statue of Ephraim, Cyprus. And of course, the tradition continues, and I'm showing you here this ornamental Sidala Antica, French one that has as a representation this frightful Gorgonia. Of course, it was also very popular and very apt as a tondo, which means the center of a drinking cup, and decorates many cups. Some early representations, as you see on the one at the left, uh, the gorgon is in full figure, still very masculine and forbidding, but frequently it's, he, it's just a mask. Uh, up it's, it has an element of surprise. So once you drink the contents of the cup, your wine, the symposiast would find this gorgon staring back at him, perhaps a warning against the ill effects of too much wine. And you see in the Hellenistic period, we have a high relief here, the same type, but the, the beautiful version. Now, on the left, this is the fam uh, famous Medusa Rondanini from the palace, named after the palace where it's exhibited in Rome, which is thought to reflect the first beautiful Gorgonian in Greek art. As you see, there are new and surprising elements in the composition. You see the two small wings on top of the head instead of the large ones at the back. And you see a pair of snakes uh, knotted together under the chin and a partially open mouth that reveals her upper row of teeth. Scholars consider the sculpture probably, it's a Roman work, it's a Roman copy of a work by Phidias, the famous Greek fifth century sculptor. Perhaps it was a sealed device on one of his sculpt statues of Athena. Now, the other centerpiece at the show is this, was this Roman chariot for female, who bears exactly the same Rondanini type, and so how popular it became in the Roman decorative arts. Uh, beautiful Gorgonians such as these ones did not become common in Greek al art until, until the 4th century BC. And they adorned various objects, like these two funerary urns. And of course, later on, they were popular on Roman floor mosaics uh, uh, that decorated Roman villas across the, Roman, the empire. And I'm showing you here examples from various, from Greece, from Zion, Spain, and then one of the most, most spectacular ones that was recently discovered in the outskirts of Rome. Of course, they were also part of the stock motifs of Roman frescoes. In the example, in the example I show you here, you see the hero Perseus triumphantly raising the severed head of Medusa. He's now very confident because he knows he has the power of her deadly gaze. But not only that, he also uh, has the power of her miraculous blood. Her blood was thought to heal and po uh, could heal and poison it. So it was, it was, it was very powerful. So this villa in at Stabia um, in uh, Italy, in uh, close to Pompeii, was first explored in the 750, 70, and perhaps, perhaps it's just an hypothesis. Uh, this was the inspiration for Canova's, Antonio Canova's celebrated marble statue, Perseus with the head of Medusa in the Vatican, which uh, monumentalized a stone, in monumentalized in stone, a very similar composition. Th now, the second version of Canova's Perseus is now the centerpiece, who for those of you who've been to the museum, to the Met in New York, now is the centerpiece of uh, the Petri Court. A plaster cut, a cl cast of the Medusa head by Canova's statue, which was made by Canova's studio, was included ex in the exhibition. And actually, it was stored in the storerooms of the one of the departments that I uh, collecting dust. And kind of like when I was doing uh, kind of an excavation in the storms of the Museum of what to include. 
I kind of we I I found it and we clean it and we put it in the soil. So, the beautiful medusa in particular, but also gorgon uh, sphinxes and the other creatures, uh, were adorning the coins of many Greek states and uh, were widely employed in the luxury arts of the ancient world, including jewelry, uh, gemstones. Here, I'm, I'm showing you here two examples of coins from Samos, <coughs> and then jewelry from those places, the Sion. The Hellenistic and Roman gemstones. And later on, of course, it was the inspiration for the neoclassical, uh, was usually uh, placed on neoclassical cameos and other jewelry. And this fa two fantastic examples. This, for example, was in the storerooms. And it's this uh, superb piece. Uh, it's an onyx cameo with the uh, Medusa cut in white and black in profile. And then this fantastic red jasper cameo by signed by Benedetto Pistrucci, which uh, kind of has the, the Rondanini type, but uh, preserves the monumentality of large-scale stone sculpture, although it's, it's a tiny object. Other examples here, and a flick, and this one, very interesting too, it's a brooch, and has this glass micro mosaic. It's amazing how tiny this uh, uh, tiles are. And it kind of alludes to her frequent uses. As I, I showed you before, the examples of the Roman mosaic, so it kind of alludes to that. Now, since the Renaissance, Medusa is represented with serpents in place of hair. An iconographic invention credited by Giorgio Vasari to a young Leonardo da Vinci, who allegedly uh, painted a rendition so frightful that it spooked his father <laughs> when he saw it. So this painting here on the left, uh, in the Uffizi, was for a long time thought to be this uh, early work by Leonardo. But now it's attributed to an anonymous Flemish painter. Of course, one of the equally haunting, interesting representations is the head of Medusa on a big uh, old rotella, this uh, round parade seal now in Florence, who was painted by Caravaggio. A modern, more contemporary recasting of the beautiful Medusa, of course, is Versace's highly recognizable logo. In a 1996 interview, Gianni Versace expli explained his choice. Uh, Medusa means seduction, dangerous attraction, sense of history, and classicism. So the black dress on the left is one of his most recognizable look. And if you see the gilded uh, safety pins feature a Medusa head and are strategically placed to captivate the beholder's gaze in the openings that are in uh, interesting places. In contrast, the you see here this bondage theme dress has again uh, buttons with Medusa head that uh, portraying him in a screaming, uh, screaming Medusas, in a sense kind of mirroring the harrowing moment of the victim's death. Now. Kate Moss, mm? sorry. Can we, I'm trying to go back. Okay, here, sorry. Uh, Kate Moss becomes Medusa. In Frank Moore's painting To Die For, commissioned by Gianni Versace, but completed after the design is murdered in 1997. So he commissioned the painting in one year and it was, the painting wasn't finished uh, before he got uh, murdered. A poignant commentary of the complex relationship between fashion and art, this painting came to symbolize the untimely uh, violent death of the designer. Now, on to this, the Sphinxes, uh, you know the Sphinxes originated in Egypt since the Bronze Age, 
are widely, appear in wide, uh, various forms throughout the Mediterranean world. In the Greeks, they represented the Sphinx as a winged lioness with a woman's head and often carved its image on funerary monuments. Along with gorgons and sirens, these tomb sphinxes uh, function, as, function as watchdogs to guard against and punish those who will disturb the dead. In class, you see the example. In classical art, and um, this is one of the still in the exhibition, you see there were elaborate diadems and necklaces. They become more feminine and have the elegantly coiffed long hair. And in the Hellenistic period, they become more ornamental. There are various uh, architectural members, that like this double sphinx in the capital from a funerary monument. They were uh, widely integrated into various implements, tripods, bronze tripods, uh, like this one, the red figure stands, uh, add plastic vases. And later on, they were part of um, Roman marble figure capitals, as the one at the right, and then uh, marble fer monumental furniture. This is a trapezophorus. It's a table leg of a Roman table that is shaped into a sphinx. It's a magnificent example in the, in, uh, in the glyptotech in uh, Copenhagen. So many Greek vases show a sphinx chasing a fleeing man or clutching him as prey. In these scenes, as the one I show you here on your screen, uh, the Sphinx combines the role of the demon who snatches the corpses of the dead warriors uh, in battle with the lover who passionately pursues handsome youths only to tear them apart. And you see in this uh, example at the gate, if you look closely, she draws blood from her chest. Now, sometimes you see other, like as the example in the Med, we see a column and an altar in this that refers to a sanctuary, but it's not always clear if these sphinxes are generic representations or are the uh, representations of the famous uh, Theban sphinx of the Oedipus uh, legend. And here is a, a, the cut in the Vatican that shows the Oedipus and the sphinx. Now, a pair of Roman marble uh, groups from Ephesus, only one of them has been reconstructed, and the one I show you, it's in uh, the museum, in the Ephesus Museum in Vienna, uh, depicts a sphinx attacking a youth, that uh, the composition masterfully captures the tension between, captures the tension between eroticism and violence. They are probably, uh, an, uh, an adaptation, although it's not certain, an adaptation of a detail on the throne of the colossal cult statue of Zeus uh, at Olympia, again made by Phidias in the late 4th 30s BC. So this theme of the ravishing sphinx was explored anew by symbolist artists who employed figures from Greek myth or biblical stories to populate their mysterious dreamlike worlds. So this, the Oedipus episode is eroticized in Moreau's uh, painting uh, Oedipus and the Sphinx at the Met, which was inspired by an earlier namesake painting of Angra in the Louvre, which was represented the, um, in turn in the exhibition by this galar etching that I'm showing you. The allegorical power of the Sphinx is aptly, I think, demonstrated by Kara Walker's public art installation in the now demolished uh, Domino Sugar Factory in New York. Uh, the colossal sugar-coated white sculpture is a racially charged symbol of the dark legacy of the sugar and slave trade.
the science in and we've saw we see in the Homer's Odyssey to go back to the Odyssey, Circe uh, warned Odysseus that if he hears the singing of the sirens, he will never come home. For they beguile men to their death with the sweetness of their song. So the, the song of the sirens was the ultimate music. It was so beautiful that nobody could resist. So Odysseus, longing to hear it, ordered, as we see on the famous representation in the British Museum, ordered his men to bind him to the mast of the ship and to put wax in their ears. This way, he managed to listen to the song, and he and his crew survived. The sirens drowned themselves, for their fate was to live until a mortal survived their deadly fall. And this, in fact, is the earliest uh, representation of their suicide. So they're committing suicide. Uh, Homer does not. I'm sorry, can you? I don't know. It's here. Homer does not describe the physical appearance of the sirens. He only talks about their, so their song. But in Greek art, they were represented as hybrid creatures with human heads and the body and claws of a bird of prey. So in the archaic period, uh, they were shown armless and the gender was still ambiguous. And sometimes they were depicted with a beard, so they were masculine. As you see here. But by the end of the fifth century, the beard disappeared and they were represented only as females. Over time, they transitioned into avian-bodied females with fully developed human chests and arms, the lat breasts and arms, uh, the latter being, of course, essential to their portrayal as musicians. Sometimes they are song songs singing, but usually they play a variety of instruments, as in the example that I show you in the exhibition. On uh, classical uh, attic grave reliefs and funerary statues, their enchanting song becomes a lament. Now, this theme of the sad, beautiful uh, siren is rendered uh, in an imaginative manner by Dufy's woodcut, which you see on the left, was included in the show. It shows uh, two beautiful sirens flying over the sea, naked from the waist up, with long, luxurious hair, bears uh, forelegs instead of arms, and fistels. So this is an uh, intermediate, as I, I would say, type between the classical bird woman and the post-classical, and perhaps more familiar to a modern audience, representation of, of the sirens as mermaids. And you see here the in this uh, draper painting. Of course, in the Renaissance, the sirens are uh, represented uh, nude, aquatic from the waist down, and holding a scaly tail in its hand. And as you can see, this was the prob probably the inspiration for the iconography of behind the logo of the Starbucks company. Now, in his trip uh, home, Odysseus also encountered Scylla, a sea monster who, together with Charybdis, terrorized sailors. Homer tells us that Scylla had 12 uh, legs and six heads, with uh, six necks, with uh, ghastly heads, and yelled like a Scylax, which in ancient Greek means puppy. So it's kind of incongruous, the whole, it was kind of ridiculous, a monster that uh, barks like, like a puppy. She snatched the uh, sailors from ships passing by her cave and devoured them. Oh, I forgot to mention. So the avian type, the bird woman, the classical type, remains. And I'm showing you an example here by Masa, Mosa, the in the ninth, uh, early 20th century imagination of this, this island. Um, in Ovid tells us again in his Metamorphosis, uh, how Scylla was once a beautiful maiden, uh, the envious sorceress Circe 
poisoned her bathing pool, transforming Skila's waste and groin into a pack of snarling dogs. So Skila was thus uh, stripped of her sexuality, was condemned to a life of solitude, sending countless sailors to their watery deaths. The earliest surviving representations of Skila come from the fifth century BC. They saw her as a hybrid with the upper body of an alluring woman, woman if you can make it uh, a fishy tail and four parts with barking dogs emerging at the hip, grasping debris from cypress like broken oars, she's poised to attack her next unsuspecting victim. So scholars interpret Skila as a semantic symbol that symbol uh, uh, unites the three concepts of sea, dog, and woman. So in a way, she expresses anxieties about the navigational hazards of the open seas, the human fear of being devoured, and the male's dread of female lust and aggression, or their opposite, namely untamed virginity. In the 19th century, this trope of the attractive but seductive woman features prominently in romantic poetry, which often used mythical or biblical females as paradigms. Thus, Lilith, a night demon, Adam's uh, insubordinate first wife in Jewish folklore, was conflated with Lamia, the famous baby snatcher of the Greek myths. As you see in Rossetti's 1866 oil painting, uh, Lady Lilith, which was replicated in this watercolor that was included in the show, the artist imagined Lilith as an emasculating sensual beauty with uh, luxurious long red hair. In contrast to Rossetti's figure, uh, the bare-breasted woman on, uh, with the long red locks and emerald green eyes in Munch's print, the, the scene, looks blankly out. Uh, Munch's erotic icon floats in the void as is frozen out of time. Though not pointing directly at the viewer, her hypnotic alien stare is reminiscent of Medusa's petrifying gaze. Today, Medusa persists as a symbol of uh, dangerous beauty and menacing sexuality. And we see, for example, Rihanna styled as Medusa on the cover of the British GQ magazine, or Uma Thurman playing Medusa in a popular Hollywood movie that retells the myth of Perseus. An insidious usage of the iconography of Medusa vilifies powerful women, especially in politics. Uh, during the heated 2016 uh, presidential election, Celine's famous uh, bronze sculpture, Perseus with the head of Medusa, which you see on the left in, uh, in uh, Florence, was appropriated by Trump's campaign. Uh, <laughs> you can see Trump here as the hero, Perseus, and Hillary Clinton as the severed head of Medusa. <laughs> In, an <laughs> in another instance, we see Angela Merkel, the former German <laughs> chancellor, <laughs> superimposed on uh, Caravaggio's famous silk, like the one I showed you before uh, from the Uffizi. It's just print. Uh, Garbati statue of Medusa holding, or this time Medusa holding Perseus' severed head, reverses the story, uh, imagining it from Medusa's perspective and uh, revealing the woman be behind the monster. Uh, the statue was uh, conceived in 2008, uh, and in 2020, the sculpture became a Me Too artwork, a symbol of triumph uh, for victims of sexual assault when it was installed in Lower Manhattan, just across the street from the criminal courthouse where the Weinstein uh, hearings took place. To sum up, uh, progressing from uh, the magnificently monstrous to the 
terrifyingly beautiful, female hybrids visualize a conflicting view of femininity, one that is alluring, but with a threatening or sinister underside. The process of their feminization was a hallmark of the imagination of classical artists who humanized and beautified the most repugnant of and hideous of all, the Gorgon Medusa. Much like Medusa's gaze, the power of the art is transforming and enduring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karoglu. That was transfixing, I might say. Our next speaker is, is Ms. Eletheria Gufa. Eletheria Gufa is a conservator and cultural manager with a demonstrated history of working in the cultural sector. She has been a paper conservator in the conservation department of the Benaki Museum in Athens since 1999. In 2017, she was appointed by the director of the Benaki Museum to start the traveling exhibitions department in parallel with her responsibilities as conservator. Her responsibilities vary by exhibition and include project management, exhibition design, conservation, transportation, and installation as well as deinstallation. She has performed these functions all around the world. With her involvement in the Benaki Museum, Eletheria always saw the value of sharing Greek culture with other cultures, both in the USA and abroad. When Eletheria became aware of George's series of works underpinned by research in each period, she encouraged him to present the work in important Greek cultural venues both in the USA and other international cities. She is happy to be managing this traveling exhibition, Hellenic Heads by George Petridis, which will continue through 2022 and into 2023. Welcome, Eletheria. Thank you, Markela, for introducing me. And I would like to thank uh, the Maleotio Cultural Center for this, ex for this uh, significant collaboration. So in my duties, I work as a conservator in the Benaki Museum. And uh, I have other duties in which I work as a cultural manager, designing the cultural policy of artists and their exhibitions. While we were working this particular project with George uh, in these exhibitions, um, we understand uh, the theme about uh, the role of women uh, in, Greek, uh, in uh, Greek society. Uh, in this particular exhibition, we have designed six oversized head that have to do with uh, different uh, periods of Greek history. So if someone sees this theme a little bit superficially, you could say that Greek society is macho, um, the man gets all the, the value, and uh, the woman is very underestimated and surpressed. But uh, if, you, if we look uh, in uh, Greek history from uh, ancient times to the Greek Revolution to 19th century uh, to nowadays, uh, we will notice that uh, the role of uh, women is so significant and valuable. Women are struggling and fighting for the families and the loved ones um, for, for many, many periods through time and history. So. This summer, as we have presented the show in uh, Southampton, uh, we had the honor to visit us a uh, very significant uh, journalist from the Ford, for the Forbes uh, newspaper. And uh, she decided to have a review and write an article about the exhibition. So while, as we're discussing, um, uh, she pointed to me the role of the, the woman and when she was uh, uh, visiting the exhibition, she said about this, is this, this exhibition has to do about female power. And uh, Natasha uh, Gorbs asked me to write a text about female nature. So I'm going to read. 
So I believe that the role of women from the Greek War of Independence of 29 through to the modern era has a common denominator which is none other than the strength and the will of female nature. I find that whether in, in the past or in the present, female nature has the same core values. Women are ready to be inspired by great ideas and ideals. They are fighting for their freedom, their survival, their spiritual awakening. They struggle and fight alongside their men and their families, and they are gifted by their very nature with the most powerful weapons. Across history, these weapons vary depending on the time and social stratification, but the female core, not in my opinion the weak sex, is strong and capable of causing daily revolutions, regardless of the era. The women of the Greek War of Independence left a great legacy as they played a decisive role in the liberation struggle of Greece. At times, these heroines acted behind the scenes, caring for the wounded of war, providing shelter and food to the fighters, and supporting morally and emotionally the men and sons of the revolution. Some were leaders, became commanders in chief like Madame Avroyenus, and sold their assets to finance the war of independence. They participated in naval operation, like Domna Fisicirit, sacrificed their lives, received honors after death, like Lascarina Bupulina. I believe that the role of women in modern Greek society, a society that, in my opinion, has always been matriarchal, does not differ much from the past. It is always about the same female heroic nature that struggles daily through many and demanding roles, personal and professional, to maintain her position, to achieve her dreams and to take care of her loved ones, with militancy but also with nurturing inherent in the female nature. So when you will visit these exhibitions, this exhibition, sorry, I hope you will see the text reflecting in the artworks. And uh, I find it that it's very strongly represented in the four uh, female figures. So I was brief, but we need to hear from my artist, George. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eletheria. Last of all, and not least, we're going to hear from George Petridis, the, art and s the artist and sculptor of the Hellenic Heads exhibit located here at Maliotti's Cultural Center, now through the end of November. A little bit about George. George Petridis, the international sculptor who lives and works in New York City from Ath and Athens, Greece, creates abstract figurative sculptures in sizes ranging from a few inches to more than life size, combining the timeless with the contemporary. Born in Athens in 1964 and raised there in New York, he is steeped in ancient Greek sculpture and the works that were influenced by it, Donatello, Michelangelo, August Rodin, Arist, and etc. as well as the 20th century modernists who reinterpreted these traditions. He closely follows contemporary figurative sculptors, especially those who reference ancient Greek art, such as Charles Ray and Humba Baba, as well as the many other artists who are part of a resurgence in figurative sculpture. With the Hellenic Heads exhibit, Petridis presents a personal exploration into his Greek background, seeking to understand the cultural influences that have shaped him and the people closest to him starting with a rigorous research process, including archeological artifacts, academic sources, family stories, and historical photographs, Petridis studied six important periods from 2,500 years ago to the present. Hellenic Heads, our current exhibit, is an artistic dialogue between the past and present, elucidating the universal character of Greek culture and its fundamental role in shaping Greek identity. This traveling exhibition highlights the necessity of art and the importance of the creator in modern society and conveys intercultural dialogue through cultural diplomacy. 
cultural diplomacy is key to the mutual understanding of other nations and their cultural heritage as it examines human development through artistic creation. Welcome, George. Great to have you tonight as part of our Meet the Artist series continuation. I'm going to use this so I can kind of see what's going on here. If we could get started with the uh, Washington installation. This was the um, embassy, uh, is the embassy in D.C., and let's just go through the installation shots, and I'll try to describe what, what we were looking at. So Markella did an excellent job describing generally what was going on or what I try to do. So there were, there were six heads, and the six heads each represented a different uh, historical period. Now, why did I embark on this uh, adventure? I was interested in what are the trends that, or what are the themes or the influences that someone who's Greek or Greek American has, and how do you become, you know, Greek American? Uh, and I, I decided to look at six different periods, and I'll, I'll just show them to you here. In each case, Markella said I looked at research, so kind of reading about the period, talking to people, going to museums. And then I, um, I found a family member that I thought would be good to pose for me. So as you'll see, we go through it, m you know, my mother, my uh, father, et cetera. And I also looked at art history. So I was interested in kind of uh, how sculptors before me had dealt with similar issues. So that's kind of the general format. And I'll talk to you about the six very briefly. And then I'll talk to you about the four females, we're going to leave aside the two men, uh, and then one of the four females got made into a statue. So just uh, 10 days ago in Athens, we had the unveiling of one of these big pieces, and I'll show you that. So uh, uh, going here, uh, what we have is the one, two, three, well, is one missing? I, I count five. What's missing? Oh, Thale is missing. Okay. So w we'll look at these five very briefly. Um, the male on the left will will leave out, but the 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 large green figure uh, is called Heroines of 1821, and all of these are sitting you know up the staircase. But Heroines of 1821 was uh, a comment, and Lefteria touched on this was a comment or an exploration of the female military leaders of the Greek War of Independence, and we'll look at that more in a second. The brown figure is about the Nazi occupation and the Greek Civil War. We'll do that next year when we talk about, you know, the males. The the um, the one way in the back there, Emmanuel, could we just go to the next slide? Maybe it's clear. Uh, maybe the next slide. Yes, this one here. The one on the right is called the refugee, and so this is about uh, Smyrna. So we had 100 years ago um, the destruction of Smyrna, and, and Many people were displaced, including my own grandmother, and many people sadly didn't make it out. But uh, this piece is about that era. Uh, the blue figure is the very first chronologically, so uh, it's Thalia, and she's about the classical Greek civilization. Uh, and so I, I think if you, if you look at these, the three females that we've talked about so far, I think you're starting to get the idea that I'm trying to weave together through these large overhead uh, sculptures, I'm trying to weave together these influences, these kind of this kind of source material that makes you Greek or makes you Greek American. So, for example, you know, uh, Thalia, the the blue figure, uh, you may not have studied classics, but somehow, you know, when you're growing up, you hear about Aristotle and Socrates, and you hear about Medusa. So, somewhere in your Greek psyche, there is this classical thing. The um, this one here, the, the refugee, many Greeks have some relationship with Smyrna or, or Podos uh, or uh, some kind of refugee experience. Maybe it's coming to the United States. So I think that comes somewhere in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the experience. Let's look at one more slide here. And then this one here, this is a curious one, uh, this blue one. I, I wanted, as I look through these periods over uh, you know, 2,500 years, I wanted to conclude by looking at the present. And the present was actually the hardest one to do. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> describing Greece today or describing the United States today is, is difficult. There's a lot of conflict and, and good things and not so good things happening. So this, this one here 
and we'll look at it a little bit in detail in a second, is about, is about the present looking towards the future. So that was, that was in D.C. We had Europe Day. Uh, 2,000, like 2,100 people came and saw this exhibit in a single day. A very uh, compact, actually, only about six or seven hours. So let's, let's Emmanuel, let's go forward. This is all six of them shown together, and you can see the four females, uh, and we'll, we'll look at each one relatively quickly. So let's keep going. Some more. Something's coming up. I, I want to I show you this, and these are actually the placards. If you, if you happen to go upstairs, you'll see them. These are the stickers that are on each of the um, stands or the pedestal bases. And so what I want you to see, you, you kind of can barely see it from here, I think, but this is the outline with which I worked for every one of the six statues. So in each case, I had a period, and as I discussed, there were six over, over that period of time. I give some technical descriptions of how the thing was made and what the dimensions are. In each case, as I mentioned, I chose a family member. So uh, someone who was alive or not alive from photographs posed for me, and they became the vehicle, um, uh, kind of the emotional uh, drive in, in terms of putting this sculpture together and giving it life. Uh, so this was my mother, or is my mother, still alive, but um, the photos the photos are of her black and white photos uh, around 1950 in Greece and very thin and you know back then people were, <laughs> were not very thin for uh, style reasons they were very, very coming out of the Second World War and the Civil War they were just famished. So the, the themes we'll look at when we look at the piece and the sculptural precedent uh, we're not going to look at today but in each of these I went back and I looked at um, another sculptor. So in some cases it's Michelangelo, in some cases it's Rodin. So I was always interested in how, do, how did other people think about, or how did other sculptors deal with this same question, uh, the same feeling or the same phenomenon of being a refugee, and you know, w could that help me as I resolve my uh, 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 statue? So let's, let's uh, Manuel, let's look at some photos of this. Coming, coming soon. So this one is upstairs. Of all six of them are upstairs, and this is, as I was saying, the classical Greek period. Emmanuel, I think we can just kind of flick through these a little bit. You, if you have a chance, go up and look at it. Here, you're getting a sense of the scale. So these are about 36 inches or so. As I was saying, uh, a classical Greek period, uh, some resemblance to my mother. The 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 um, the colors are this bluish. Uh, brass kind of patinated uh, that you see. Let's keep going and probably we'll move forward to the next one. The profile here, kind of distinctive. Let's move, let's move for the next one. The next one, the next one I think is the heroines of 1821. So last year I was asked to do something for the Greek Revolution, and, and as you know, that was 200 years from, uh, last year was 200 years from the inception of the revolution, which was 1821 to 2021. And so here I, um, I, I didn't want to do something uh, about the warlords, Kairi Skykis and all these people that you see, the typical, you know, the big mustaches and the big craggy nose. I wanted to look at, and this goes to Eleftheria's uh, speech that she uh, wrote for you or read to you, I wanted to look at the female leaders within the Greek Revolution. So there were three specific ones that are named here. I think they're named here. No, they're not named here. Bubulina is Lascarina Bubulina, Doma Vizi, and Madame Avrogenis are the ones that stand out the most. And they were all naval commanders, and in all cases, they gave their fortune and their. Um, uh, lives, uh, in some cases, or ultimately they did, uh, for, for the struggle, you know, the Greek War of Independence. So when we look at, let's go and uh, look at the piece. Again, you can see this upstairs, but for the moment I'll show it to you here. Th 
this is the piece. So here I was, I was referring to uh, some French sculpture that came out, uh, I don't know, in the mid-1815s or so by Cordier is the name of the sculptor. But I was, I was interested in showing uh, a modern woman. You know, the, the, the traditional dress gives a sense that she's a Greek, uh, you know, Evzonos or a military outfit of that period of time. But the hair might be of a modern woman. And then the gaze is meant to show, can we see some more of these? The gaze is meant to show some defiance and some vision and looking forward. And you have that you know, traditional little Amalia cap on top that many of you uh, know. And then this just shows the scale, which is re relatively large, about 36 inches or so. So I like the way the hair came down, and it's kind of dynamic. And, and you know, with, with the, the I think the whole thing turned out good. Let's keep going. Here's the face. The next one, I believe, is the refugee. So we'll look at that, and then we'll look at the large statue that was just unveiled uh, 10 days ago in Athens. So here, the refugee, uh, you know, there were, there were multiple uh, instances. There was the actual destruction of Smyrna in 1922, which was just really concluded September 19th. And then there was the population exchange that occurred, you know, a few months after that, starting in uh, January of 23. And millions of people were affected. In my case, uh, I imagined, as you'll see, my grandmother, or as I mentioned, my grandmother when she was a young woman arriving in Athens. And, and so let's, let's actually, uh, Emmanuel, let's go ahead and look at the piece. Um, here, uh, I didn't, I was you know, working with photographs, someone who was no longer alive, or, or actually, excuse me, not even photographs, because my grandmother at 19 was someone I, you know, never, never met, nor were there photographs uh, existing of her. So I was interested in capturing the, the shock. Uh, so my grandmother was from a relatively well-off family in Smyrna, and as you might know about Smyrna, it was a cosmopolitan city, and you had a, a documentary here last night. So it was uh, a cosmopolitan, relative to Greece certainly, a relatively wealthy uh, port, uh, with all the sophistication there. And my grandmother was part of that, and uh, that my grandfather was a captain, a sea captain, and they lost it all, and she ended up in Greece, you know, with the clothes on her back in 1922. Uh, so I was uh, here, can we forward? I was, well, more forward. Yeah, here I was trying to capture the, you know, the shock and also the grief of having this experience, but also showing perhaps a little bit some dignity and accepting this and in starting to uh, create a new life. Some more. You can see the scale here. Close up, and let's let's switch to the public uh, statue. So this is kind of a treat for me, and, and and I hope for you because this is the first time I've shown these photos. Uh, so September fourteenth, just you know, ten days ago or less, uh, was the unveiling of this public statue of mine. Here it is. So it's based on. It's based on the one that you saw and the one that you see upstairs, but it's much larger. It's about um, sitting on its base. It's about nine feet tall. And let's, here, could we just flick through these relatively fast, just get a sense of uh, almost like a movie, like you're walking around it. And this is, uh, this is a, a, a neopsychiko. So this is an area of Athens where many refugees settled around 1929 to 1930 from a part of Athens called Vurla. So, so stop there for a second. So that church, that church there. Maybe could you go forward so we'll see the church some more. Uh, that's a very nice, here it is. So this church is the third uh, incarnation of this church that was built in this area. These refugees arrived in 1929 and uh, the first church was like a little hut and over time they you know, accumulated some resources. So this church uh, uh, harks back to a church in Burla uh, from about 1556. So these people came to this area. They they you know rebuilt their lives over the course of time. This was made into a, a little uh, monument or a little uh, memorial here. So you, you you can barely see it, but the the names of the cities, these cities in Asia Minor, are actually kind of carved in the marble or the granite rather. And uh, you know I was allocated this little spot here that you see over there where the flowers well where you see where the base and the statue are. And, and I, I, I'm very pleased. I think the whole thing just kind of came together like it was always meant to be one design. You know, that, that church, that, that um, 
what do you call it, that water uh, memorial, and then my own piece. Manuel, let's keep clocking. Yeah, here's, here's another view of it. So, so uh, you know, some of the challenges were how do you make something much larger? How do you do it in Greece? Because I had to work with local artisans and, you know, <laughs> everything happened at the last minute, as I'm sure you, you would believe me on that with Greece. And then, um, uh, you know, designing the base and getting something that was appropriate. And then in terms of the dimensions, could you go forward? You'll see kind of me uh, standing next to it. Keep going. Yeah, so, so one of the things, so when I was looking at the dimensions, I wanted to, I wanted to do it so that it was kind of the way I remembered my grandmother, you know, as a child, and I'd be looking up at her. So I had this angle that I wanted to capture, and then I wanted the piece itself to be large so that it had some monumentality. So you felt, okay, this was an important, um, an important person or an important uh, phenomenon to, you know, honor. But then at the same time, I wanted it, uh, I wanted the base low enough so that you could relate to it, so people could actually walk up to it and touch it if they felt they, they wanted to do that. Let's keep going. Just like we just go through these. I think you got the idea. So here, here you kind of see the relative scale. I think we could move to the last one, and then. Uh, uh, so the last one was the most interesting or the most difficult one, and and I, I think it's, in some ways, it's the piece that uh, I would want to rework. But you'll see it, and I'll talk to you about it. It has the it's the present. So as I'd looked at all these historical period, and we left out the. You know, we left out the two male versions or the two male figures, but th for the present, uh, initially I had my daughter pose. So my daughter's twelve, and you know, obviously a very sweet, girlish face, uh, as, as I write here, opt uh, optimism and innocence. And what I, so I started, and it started looking like her. But as I kept going, because I was thinking about, you know, what's going on in Greece politically, economically, and socially, uh, it, it, it changed. And it's, it's, let's keep looking at it. So it's, it's a piece that in some ways is, I don't, I don't think it's disturbing, although someone did say it was disturbing, but let's take a look at it. I, I wanted to capture, I wanted to capture a sense of optimism that something good can still happen in Greece. But I also wanted to capture some, I don't want to say t maybe turmoil, maybe it's in the hair, maybe it's in the roughness of the surface, but I, I wanted to give it a, a, can we keep going? I wanted to give it a color that was unusual, so it went kind of into this dark blue with this lying over this brass. So uh, perhaps it's the most experimental of the pieces, but I, I do hope you get a chance to see it upstairs. Any more images on this? The side image here, side image here, front image here. I think I think that's it. If do you have any does anyone have any questions I'd be delighted to answer on any of the pieces or in general. Yes, sir. The they're they're made of different things. This one here was brass uh, with uh dye. The the green face is actually bronze. It's bronze with a patina, with a, like a Tiffany green patina. The uh the thalia is brass. The, the bright blue one, and that's brass, and you have to have that lighter color in order to get those big colors, those those bright colors. So that's brass with like a combination of a blue dye and an acid. And then what else did I show? Oh, and then the refugee is just plain old-fashioned bronze with black wax. So I, I like to use, you know, when I was setting up the six heads, and you know, you can, hope, I hope you make the time to see them, I try to get each of them to be different. So when you walk in, you know, there's like variety. I didn't want to show you like, you know, six brown heads. Yes, sir. Or yes, sir. President, Mr. President. <laughs> oh, this is a one hour question. That's an excellent question. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, there's an implicit question, which is how are things done in Greece differently than we do them here? Because the big one got done in Greece. I'll, I'll try to. What's, th what's that? We don't have time. No, we don't have time for that. I'll try to answer generically. It's a, but it's a good question. The, s the ones that are upstairs, the ones that are upstairs are basically handmade by me. So they're a combination of plaster and foam and um, what, what the heck else is in there? Plywood and brick and things like that. So they're, they're, they're 
you know, they're handmade, and then there's a metal coating that gets put on top of them, and then the ashes and the patinas, and they form these surfaces. The one in Greece, the, the one in Greece is my first large one, and I now have another large one that's actually much larger going up in a, in a few months. Um, and I think I'm going to make that in Greece, although after my experience just, you know, in the last six weeks, I'm not sure I can ever, you know, take the stress of <laughs> doing it in Greece, but I probably will end up doing it in Greece again. But the technology for the big one that you saw I is quite different. It's actually made like a boat. So it's made, it's 3D printed, the big one. The big one is 3D printed in polyester panels that are you know, about this big, and then they're assembled. And on the inside of it, it's, it's uh, held together by polyester tape with polyester resins. So you get something that's basically a boat. Uh, and then um, once that's the form that I want, um, we have an American technology and I have to kind of carry it all in my luggage and it's basically a uh, bronze powder that um, is sprayed on so like 12 layers or so will go on to that and it'll be it'll become uh, a very thin bronze shell so that one that you saw with me you know standing on it that's basically a bronze shell on top of something that is pretty much built the way a boat would be built I think that that kind of answers the question. The second one, the big one? Well, it's a good question. I mean, the, the, from the very beginning to the very end, I would say it was about a year. But a year involved the first one that you saw in Washington, D.C., and then kind of scanning that, manipulating that in the computer, printing it in Greece, you know, recutting it in Greece. My whole adventure is dealing with the Greek craftsmen. So that whole thing was probably about a year. Sure. You had a question? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, um, 14 months was the period from kind of starting the first one to ending the last one. And uh, it probably wasn't enough time, but I had to deliver to your, <laughs> to your colleagues, uh, Consul General's colleagues, to Washington. Uh, and like the day before the opening, I was, you know, still uh doing stuff for 14 months 14 months but you know some of these i'm i'm looking forward to kind of like when no one's looking you know getting them and kind of reworking them changing something about them yes sir that's a good question too i uh i i did uh i did the blue head Initially, I was doing smaller heads, and then I got some. Someone said to me, "You should do large heads." So I did the blue head large uh, that you saw, and then I did the male head, the male brown head, which I, I referenced. You know, if I, it was about the Second World War and the the Nazi occupation, etc. Those were the first two I did, and um, I think Eleftheria, when we were starting to plan the ex exhibition, uh, mentioned to me, you know, you should do something for. The 1821, because that was a Greek theme, and then you should do something for Smyrna, because that was obviously a theme. Uh, and that made another two. Uh, and so, uh, 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 and of course, because, uh, you know, if, if you go back to, and we didn't really touch on this, if you go back to what are the other things that make you Greek, and um, could you just show very, Emmanuel, just that very first couple of slides? Uh, one of the big things, and I'll just take up your time on this, because we're in a somewhat religious setting uh, was Christianity and, and Byzantium. So I was interested in showing, um, I was interested in, or oh I picked one that was Constantine based. So it was uh, this one, this one on the left, but do we have a better shot of that perhaps? No, keep going, keep going. Uh, yeah, that, that, there, that was okay. That shot on the left. So that was one, that was kind of the last one that I did, but I wanted a slot, I wanted a, slot the six in so that it captured like the threads of what does it mean to be Greek American. So, you know, even if you're not religious, and I, I, I hope I don't get kicked off campus, I don't, you know, I don't go to church every day or every week or every month. I go, at least I go every year, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but um, what's my point is, is part of being Greek American is having a church influence because you grew up with it or you, you were dragged there for Easter or maybe you're more religious or maybe you had more education as people do in this place. Long way of saying that piece was important to 
completing the story of what does it mean to be Greek American, it's also the last piece I did and I had the least amount of time on it. Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Yes. Yeah, I would say there's some kind of reason. Could you show the uh, the Greek embassy again? The short answer is it's specific to the piece. So, for example, um, the refugee, which has the sense of shock and and um, uh, uh, despondence, for example, I wanted to show here. Well, you can show this one. This is a great one. So, so I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to have that hollowness reflect something about the feeling that the person was having at the time, but I also wanted, from a distance, for you to be able to see uh, that the eyes stand, that there's something distinct about the eyes, and the only way to do that is to have it be completely dark, and it's it's. That's really it. So even, I mean, you, here you're looking at it from across, from quite a distance, but you can see there's something about the eyes that maybe it interests you and maybe you go see it. Could we see the embassy one very quickly, the first couple of pages? Thalia, similarly, there was something mysterious uh, about Thalia, kind of a little bit about that is about my relationship with my mother, which is, you know, up and down. But... Um, uh, there's something mysterious about the eyes, and her mouth is a little bit open. It's also uh, empty. You'll see that, or, uh, you know, um, maybe that'll come up. Thalia, keep going. Thalia is the blue one. The, that was a good shot right there, Emmanuel. So this one here, you also see the eyes are um, hollowed out, and that makes a distinct impression. The other one, Constantine, which is based on my father, or my father was you know, my father who's deceased, but through the photographs I had posed for it, as it were, posed. That one, um, I wish I had a close-up of it, but that has normal eyes, so the eyes are, you know, present, and then the, the holes are drilled in, and I was making a reference to the Constantine. Have you seen the Constantine statues in Rome or in the Met where he has, like, these eyes and they look up, referencing heaven? Well, I didn't go that far to reference heaven, but I, I made a, an indented, clear eye because that, to me, was about vision and looking forward and establishing Christianity in, you know, 310 to 380 A.D. when those laws were, the councils were created and made Christianity uh, the official religion of the empire. So that one I was, oh, here we go, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say. So that's a very specific eye. It both references the historical Constantine statues, which one of them is at the Met, uh, uh, and uh, b but it also gives a specific feeling of you know what is it, what does it mean to establish Christianity, uh, you know when a few years before it was illegal and then you made it legal and then you made it the official uh, religion of the empire. That's pretty much the eyes. Maybe one or two more questions and we're done for today. Anyone else? Yes, Kiki. The return of figural sculpture, figurative sculpture. Uh, that's a good question too. Um, it's a big question, and I, I all I can say is that uh, the, the, the the larger question is, what does it mean to make a sculpture that looks like a person versus something that's totally abstract, like a modern sculpture that you see when you're walking around an office park, and there are like these metallic things, the rings. Uh, to me, I, I try to find something interesting and valid in any kind of sculpture I see. So I, I like that kind of sculpture. But um, what's most interesting to me is kind of other people and what makes other people tick and my own experiences of other people and why I don't understand them. Or uh, uh, So for me, figurative sculpture is kind of what I'm interested in spending my time doing. Um, is there a resurgence? I guess there is. It goes in and out of fashion. So every few decades, you know, there'll be like 30 years when like no one does figurative sculpture because it's like uncool. And then now uh, there was a big show at the Met, Charlie Ray, which is almost exclusively figurative. And Huma Baba, who's also figurative, is red hot and selling, you know, sculptures for 350000 So it, 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 uh, there are fads. 
Uh, but kind of the, the part of the wave that I want to ride is, you know, the figurative. Shall we close it, uh, Mr. President and Miss, uh, I don't see her here. Yes, sir. Yes. Representational sculpture evolved, evolved over time. Uh, that, that too is, uh, that, that's interesting to me because um, that's also a long question because, long answer, because uh, the, 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 the easy answer is size. So like this one that you saw is, I don't know, it's about, well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's 2 meters 70, 2 meters 70. The next one I'm doing is, uh, well, it's about the same, but it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a very large uh, naked woman for the University of Athens Medical School. Um, and that one is about uh, 2 meters, two me the body is 2 meters 9, and it's on a shorter base. So that'll be about 3 meters tall in total, slightly taller than the one you saw. So I think as a sculptor, um, you know, we talked about private equity before. You always kind of want to do the bigger deal and the bigger company and the bigger whatever. Uh, so uh, the natural tendency is to go larger. Shall we call it a good day? Yep. Thank you, and thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending this mini conference. And there are refreshments outside, and we ask that you also enjoy the, the exhibit upstairs, Hellenic Heads by George Petridis. Thank you for coming out tonight.